<clears throat> so you've already heard today that there are over half a billion people on Facebook. We're talking about what would be the third largest country in the world, and the next few years it will become the largest country in the world. Now, that sounds very gee whiz. It sounds very uh, much the kind of thing that you would hear at a TED Talk. Look at all these people doing this thing that's technologically innovative. And we're interested in trying to figure out how this might be producing the next wave. Well, I'm going to try and think about this in a somewhat different way. Because while we might have one vision, which is this, the future, we have another vision, which is that these new technologies are actually going to be doing something very different. They're going to be taking us back to our anthropological past. They're going to be taking us back to the village. In some sense, the period that we've lived in over the last 200 years, 400 years or so, has been an anomaly as we've moved into cities and our social networks have been ripped asunder. And this new innovation in technology, I think, is actually going to take us back to a state of living that is much more like what we are designed to be as human beings. Now, to fully understand what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about going back to the village, what I needed to do is I needed to put you guys in a frame of mind where you understood what a social network is. And so each of you today had conversations. And how many of you reported on your conversations? Raise your hand really high. Yes, and that's exactly what I will report, is that we had about 80% of you um, who are attending today um, tell us who you had conversations with. Well, each one of these conversations, we can think of them in isolation. And in fact, social scientists typically do start by thinking of these influences between a pair of people. But it's not just one conversation that happened in the room today. It's actually many conversations that happened. Um, and so when we think about those conversations, in addition to the fact that we had hundreds of them going on at each of the breaks and some in between, those conversations were also interconnected. So that when you had a conversation with one person, it spurred an idea in them that they then carried to the next person that they had a conversation with. And so what we really get a sense of is that to fully understand how these ideas mix, we need to understand how we as a village form a social network. Now, in my work with Nicholas Christakis, we have studied real world social networks, not the kind online, but real social networks, your friends, your neighbors, your spouses, your siblings. And the place where we have started to do this the most is in this wonderful study that took place in Framingham, Massachusetts. We followed 5,000 people over 32 years and had the good fortune of discovering that in administrative records that there was detailed social network information about real, close, face-to-face -face contacts over that whole period of time. And the very first thing that we studied was obesity. We took those people um, not this woman in particular, but, but we took those people, those 5,000 people, and we put them into these diagrams where each of the circles is a person and each line represents a relationship. And what we did is we then colored the circles according to whether or not people were obese or not. Um, and when we did that, we started to do some statistical analysis to see to what extent the network could tell us something that we didn't know about obesity before. And this is what we found. We found that if you were connected to somebody who was obese, it increased your likelihood of being obese by about 40%. If you were connected to, to someone who was connected to someone, the friend of a friend, if that person was obese, it increased your likelihood of being obese by about 20%. And if your friend's friend's friend was obese, it increased the likelihood that you would be obese by about 10%. In other words, here was some information that in the network we have these clusters that are formed by us choosing to be with people who are similar to us and also influencing others so that they become similar to us. And it's these structures that we started to see not just when we looked at the state of obesity, but we also saw it when we looked at a study of smoking. If you quit smoking, your friends were likely to quit and their friends were likely to quit and their friends were likely to quit. We also looked at drinking behavior. We found that people who abstain tend to 
help their friends to abstain who help their friends to abstain, and people who drink heavily, unfortunately, help their friends to drink heavily, who then in turn help their friends to drink heavily. Um, we also looked at emotional states. Um, and so in this map, we actually color people according to whether or not they report feeling happy or sad. And so in this case, the yellow nodes are happy, the blue nodes are, can you guess? Sad, that's right, so it's very counterintuitive coloring. But we find here, once again, that if your friend's friend's friend is happy, then I can do better than chance at predicting whether or not you'll be happy. And we find some limited evidence that at least some of this is the result of a spreading process. That when you feel happier, it spreads through the network up to three degrees of separation. So we started to get this picture that these clusters extend out to three degrees of separation. But why? Why three? Why not seven? Why not two? Well, one of the things that we started to observe was that we needed to have more information in an experimental context to make sure that these clusters weren't just driven by the fact that people might choose to be friends with people who are similar to them. So we studied an experiment in the laboratory where people were randomly exposed to other people who were more or less generous in a giving game. People were given a certain amount of money, and they were given the opportunity to give as much money as they wanted away to a group cause, or they could keep all the money for themselves. And the people who were exposed to people who were more generous were in turn more generous in the future when they played with a different group of people. And this effect spread over the course of the experiment as people got assigned to new groups and new groups, you'll never guess it, up to three degrees of separation. And in fact, um, when Eleni gave more to Lucas, that meant Lucas gave more to Erica, Erica gave more to Jay, and Jay gave more to Brecken. This cascade yielded a matching grant-like property in the network. Every dollar given in the first round yielded an additional three dollars in giving over the course of the entire experiment. And so we really think that there's something here that is with us. It's something uh, essential. It's something about being human, that we influence people and are influenced by them at these indirect levels, at people greater than one degree of separation away. So we started to look in the anthropological literature for explanations for this, and we came upon this lovely paper by Robin Dunbar. Um, he actually was very interested in human group size. And he thought to himself, well, maybe we can figure out what natural human group size ought to be by looking at our non-human primate cousins. And so he took all of the brains of the set of uh, primates that he could find and, and measured the, rate at, with the, uh, the weight of their uh, neocortex relative to the rest of the brain, and he compared that to the average group size. And what he found was a nice straight line, a nice, you know, you, you don't get lines that fit this well usually in social science or in, in these in the anthropological sciences. And so then he did something very clever. We know about how much of the human brain is devoted to the frontal cortex, and he just looked along the x-axis and extrapolated up the y-axis, and he gets the number 150. And this is now known as Dunbar's number. And the reason why this is important for our story about social networks is because the average person, in survey after survey, when you ask them to name their close friends and family members, they'll tell you they have about five or so close people that they're in contact with. These are their direct connections. Well, five times five times five is 125. And so maybe it's the case that the reason why we get this three degrees result is because natural selection wouldn't have acted on us to have any more influence than we already have. There would have been no benefit for us to influence 600 people because we were never in groups of 600 people before. So what do we do with these natural networks? Well, in the real world, what we find is that even today, just like in the past in anthro anthropological studies that show that natural human group size is about 150 people, we find groups like the Hutterites that actually split when they reach the number 150, because they find that, that groups that are larger than that are unmanageable. In essence, this is the, the core of the social intelligence hypothesis, that our brains were built to live in these social networks. And so, what does this mean for online social networks? Well, take, for example, this dorm that we mapped. This is the, all of the real-world connections in this dorm of, of about 105 individuals. This looks like something manageable. Like, everybody in this group probably knows who their friends are, and who their friends' friends, and who their friends' friends' friends, more or less. And now let's layer on Facebook. 
On Facebook today, we have 140 friends on average. This is way, way more than the number of close social contacts that we have in real-world social networks. And so as a consequence, we have to ask the question, are we going to find the same kinds of influence in these new online social networks that we'll find in real life? Are we going to be influenced by all those 140 people that we supposedly are directly connected to? Well, to answer that question, we can talk to this person. Does anybody know who this is? Alyssa Milano. So you may know her from the 80s hit show, Who's the Boss? Or if you're um, a little younger in the audience, you might know her from Charmed. It turns out that Alyssa Milano loves to tweet, and tweeters love Alyssa Milano. She has over one million followers. And so you'll never guess what she tweeted. She tweeted a direct link to our book, the Amazon page for our book. And so a normal person would have gotten really excited and thought, aha, yes, I'm going to sell lots and lots of books. Um, we were a little more skeptical. Um, the reason why is because this work on real-world social networks has led us to believe that it's only deep, close social contacts that make a difference. And so we went to look at the book sales of, uh, of our book over a, uh, about a 30-day period, and guess where she tweeted? She tweeted right there. So there's absolutely no evidence that this person who has one million followers on Twitter, who tweeted a direct link to the Amazon website for our book had any impact on book sales whatsoever. This is not scientific study, this is anecdotal, but it illustrates the point that these online networks aren't necessarily as powerful as these real world social networks. And so, um, what we have done is we've started to look at these, these online networks in a different way. What we're trying to do is we're trying to look at Facebook, for example, not at all of the friends, but look at the people who upload and tag a picture of other people on Facebook. We call these picture friends. And then we get a network that looks like this. It's not that tangled ball of spaghetti, but it's a place where people have, on average, again, about five or six close picture friends. And here what we've done is we've colored the network according to whether or not people are smiling in their profile pictures or not smiling. <laughs> That's Nicholas. I always have to make fun of him. Um, and what do we find? We find that smiling in your profile picture on Facebook extends up to two degrees of separation through these real-world social networks. How about obesity? We find clusters of overweight women and clusters of overweight men, as categorized by undergraduate coders, um, but we find clusters that extend up to two degrees of separation. So online, there is influence, but it is only through these real-world social connections. And so this, this leads me to ask the question, so what's changed? You know, what's so different? What is this next wave, this one billion person nation online, what is it going to be about? Well, this, it seems like the thing that we're really focused on right now is privacy. So all of a sudden, you know, you used to be able to go down the bar and have a good time, and now you find this on your Facebook status page. <laughs> and people feel like this is very different. But is it? Think about what it's like to live here. In the village, if you get drunk, everybody is going to know about it. <laughs> and so this feeling that it's different, it's not that this is something that we're not used to as human beings, it's that we've been through a very weird part of our human history. We've been through a part of our history with the rise of cities, where we've moved from the countryside for economic opportunity and left our social networks behind. This process has ripped our real-world social networks apart so that the people that we spend time with are much more like strangers than like real deep social connections that we would have had in the village. We also have become much more mobile. I love this figure. This is a figure of a man's great-grandfather, his grandfather, his father, and himself in terms of the mobility. And each one of these squares grows by a factor of 10 over the course of the last 100 years. We now travel all over the world, and we have friends all over the world, and it's very hard to maintain a face-to-face -face close relationship with somebody that you only see once a year. And so these things have made it much more the case that we are, expect anonymity and we expect privacy, but this is different. In the village, we didn't expect those things. Another thing that has changed is that we now keep in touch with people. And so we managed to use these online social networks to overcome this increase in anonymity. This is a picture of uh, a friend of mine, Scott. And Scott actually um, has just been through a serious time where 
um, he had to have a very serious surgery. Um, and normally, when you have this kind of life-threatening surgery, you tell your closest friends and family, and they're the only ones that know. But on Facebook, this is a status message that he got, that he showed um, whenever he recovered from the surgery and survived, still having some problems to speech, but moving a lot, and I'm in good spirits. And there were 109 people who liked this. There were 76 comments. This is way, way more information that he got right away about people feeling good for his well-being than he would have gotten living in this anonymous life that we've lived in for the last 200 years. But this is exactly the kind of support he would have gotten if he was living in the village. And so we also have a choice with these new online networks to make the people that we spend time with. We have a choice to link to people, and we have a choice to choose the kinds of people that we want to be with. This is a picture of people who have done just that. This is a picture of the political blogosphere. And the blue nodes are the liberal blogs, and the red nodes are the conservative blogs, and the lines are the links between them. And you can see that what has become of the internet is that you have a huge conservative cluster and a huge liberal cluster, and no one is talking across ways. And this is very dangerous. This is helping to contribute to polarization. And this is why it's so important for us to do things like TED. Because I want you to take a look, first of all, at our online community. We mapped the Twitter network um, before you guys even came here today and looked at all the people who were following somebody else who gave us their Twitter address. And we also today had you all fill out information about interesting conversations that you had today, and this is a picture of that network. And it's very hard to make this out, but I'll tell you a couple of really interesting things about this. First of all, there's no correlation in gender in these conversations. In other words, men were just as likely to talk to women as they were to men. And this is unusual. We usually find that there's people grouping according to type. Women talk to women, men talk to men. We also see very little correlation in the kinds of interests people have. And so I have up here listed all the different things that people said they were interested in about this particular TED conference. conference. Community, ecology, invention and discovery, and those things were not correlated either. In fact, you guys seem to be an ideal community in the sense that you were striving to reach across barriers. You were striving to create a community that was not based on what you already knew, but based on what you wanted to discover. And so I want to take with you from this lesson about social networks that we now, in the online world, have the power to create new real-world networks. We have the power to create new communities. We have a pa the power to go back to the village. And by going back to the village, I think they will all come to realize, realize that the next wave is you. Thank you very much. Yeah.